Sri Lanka currently faces its worst economic crisis since gaining independence from Britain in 1948. Double-digit inflation and food and fuel shortages have led to massive protests in the streets. It's also forced the government to look abroad for help to avoid bankruptcy. Shanta Devarajan is a professor of international development at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service and was formerly Director for Development Economics and Acting Chief Economist at the World Bank. And he joins us now from Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Very good. Well, let's just, because I don't want to assume that all of our viewers uh, know a great deal about this country, uh, let's, Sheldon, if you would, bring up a graphic here. Here's a map of Sri Lanka. It is formerly Ceylon, an island country lying in the Indian Ocean. 22 million people live there, separated from India by the Polk Strait. It gained its independence from Britain in 1948. There are three ethnic groups that make up the vast, vast majority of the population, Sinhalese, Tamil, and Muslim. That's 99% of the country's population right there. The official languages are Sinhala and Tamil. Colombo is Sri Lanka's largest city, and the country is facing its worst financial crisis since its independence, with foreign exchange reserves shrinking by more than 16% to $1.93 billion in March. Okay, let's get into this. Before we get into the factors that have led to the current economic crisis, just if you would, give us a sense of how things are on the ground today in Sri Lanka. Well, the situation on the ground is, is terrible. Um, people are facing shortages in food, uh, milk powder, uh, and things like that. In uh, fuel, uh, there are long queues for gasoline, and uh, there's a shortage of cooking gas. Uh, there are serious shortages of medicines, uh, including life-saving medicines that are needed for, for patients in hospitals and so on. And there are power cuts. Uh, in fact, I was just an hour ago on the uh, on a video conference with the, a group of people in Sri Lanka, and one of them just had to drop out because his power was cut. Uh, there are about eight hours of power cuts a day uh, in uh, large parts of the country. The, uh, so the situation overall is, uh, is is one of the worst that they have experienced in the in the long history of the of the country. And the protesters seem to be very much having their president in the sort of, uh, well, in the crosshairs, if I can put it that way. Why is it all focused on him? Well, that's the interesting thing, because the, the uh, crisis that we are experiencing now was something you could have anticipated two years ago and done something about it. What happened was two years ago, Sri Lanka uh, was essentially cut out of uh, access to capital markets. They couldn't borrow in capital markets. Uh, and yet they had a high debt that they had to repay. But instead of trying to go for a restructuring of that debt, as many countries do when they're in, faced with that situation, they continue to repay that debt out of their reserves. And as a result, they ran out of money with which to buy imports. So the people protesting in the streets put the blame squarely on the policies that the government followed, misguided, in my view, policies. and despite the fact that many economists in the country, as well as those outside like me, were, were trying to advise the government to go for a debt restructuring and uh, uh, also uh, go for a program with the International Monetary Fund. The president, President Rajabska, I gather his nickname is the Terminator. How did he get that nickname? <laughs> Gee, I, actually, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, he, uh, he was the defense secretary of, of Sri Lanka during the uh, the end of the civil war, and I think there were some there, there are allegations of attacks against uh, uh, ta the Tamil uh, population, including civilians, and so they may have associated that with uh, with decisions that he took. Hmm. Now, one of the interest, uh, one of the reasons I should say that we are interested in this story here, not just because that it is happening on the ground in Sri Lanka, but we have a significant diaspora population, particularly of Tamils, in the province of Ontario. And I wonder if you could tell us how you think all of what's going on overseas is affecting the diaspora worldwide, but in particular here. Well, I'm sure. And, and by the way, some of those diaspora Tamils in 
Ontario are my relatives, so <laughs> uh, uh, I hope they're watching. Um, the, uh, the situation can affect uh, the diaspora in general and those in, in Canada in particular in, in several different ways. One is just, just the, the fact that people are facing this hardship, that your relatives and friends in the country are going through this is, is, is really quite, uh, quite painful. Uh, but the second thing is there's not a whole lot that they can do about it. Uh, that some people have been sending money um, and raising funds to help uh, uh, help the people in, in dire straits. But again, the situation was such that for the longest time, the government kept a fixed exchange rate, the exchange rate of rupees to the dollar uh, fixed, whereas the actual cost of the dollar was much higher. And so people didn't want to send money through official channels. Um, and, and, and in fact, remittances, which is mostly from people in the Middle East, working in the Middle East, actually went down last year uh, uh, as a result of the, the, uh, dis the distortionary economic uh, policies. So this, th there's a frustration, I'm sure, about uh, wanting to help our people but not having uh, means of changing. The other is, as I mentioned earlier, that there seems to be a wide consensus among the diaspora population as to what needs to be done to get out of this crisis. And there was such a consensus two years ago, and people have been advocating and writing articles and going on TV like I'm doing right now. Um, and yet the government wasn't listening. And that's actually adds to the frustration. When you can see this, you can see the, the, the train crash approaching uh, and, and you've been warning people about it, and it's still not doing anything. Hmm. I will follow up on that in just a moment, but I wanted to ask you, just following up on the diaspora question, uh, do you know whether there is much of an attempt uh, by families here to extricate their relatives who are still living in Sri Lanka to bring them over here? I, I know that there's been a, an increase in emigration. That's, that's for sure. Uh, whether that's by, uh, by uh, family uh, uh, or relatives living in uh, the Canada and the U.S. and places, I, I don't know for, for sure. But I know that there's been an acceleration of the, uh, the out-migration. Okay, let's get back onto the financial path here. What, in your judgment, have been the root causes of the financial problems Sri Lanka is currently encountering? I would put the root causes back to the... Uh, initial days of the Rajapaksa government when they were after they were elected in 2019 when they cut taxes um, in the, uh, in November 2019 and they cut it drastically I mean they cut the value added tax rate by seven percentage points and Sri Lanka already has a pretty low revenue base and so the revenue dropped so the re tax revenue to GDP is about eight percent which is one of the lowest in the world. And as a result of that, two months later, the credit rate, uh, rating agencies uh, downgraded Sri Lanka down to near default levels. So basically, as a result of that tax cut, Sri Lanka lost its ability to access capital markets. Uh, and, and this was in uh, March of 2020, which keep in mind, that was a month before the pandemic. So this is before the COVID pandemic hit the country was already in a very difficult situation. Now, of course, the pandemic made things worse because not only were there expenses in order to protect the population from the ravages of COVID-19, but also there was a drop in tourist revenues as global travel and, and tourism uh, came to a grinding halt. Uh, so the country lost its foreign exchange uh, one of its greatest foreign exchange earners, which is tourism. And that's why the situation got increasingly worse because they only had those reserves and not a whole lot of extra foreign exchange was coming in. And they kept kept paying their debt service, uh, kept, kept repaying their bondholders. Uh, and that actually then led to the foreign exchange reserves, as you observe, down to a bare minimum. Now we're down to of the order of a few million dollars of uh, foreign exchange reserves uh, the, the, was the last estimate I saw. Uh, and yet you need foreign exchange to buy these imports, to buy cooking gas, to buy milk powder, to buy medicines, uh, and to buy fuel. Did the government 
understand and realize that it had cut taxes too deeply and, and appreciate that it was in a pickle and needed to do something differently? You know, I, it's, this is still a mystery to me. Uh, the, certainly the government rhetoric was the opposite. The government rhetoric was, we will, uh, we will get through this uh, crisis. And in fact, the, governor, the then governor of the, the former governor of the central bank issued something called a roadmap back in September of 2021, which was a credibly optimistic view of how they were going to get money from various sources, uh, Middle East and the Chinese and so on, that would help Sri Lanka get out of this uh, situation and emerge strong uh, and uh, powerful. Uh, but I can't believe that they actually thought this was the case. I mean, no, nobody else, everybody else outside of government uh, was was uh, pointing out that this was a real disaster uh, in the making. Um, but for some reason, and I don't know the answer to why, uh, the government actually didn't act until uh, January or February of this year, uh, when they decided to uh, undertake a debt restructuring and um, approach the IMF for a program. I'll get to that in a second, but I do want to find out, well, the war in Ukraine has had an impact, a negative impact on, on obviously not just Ukraine, but frankly, all, you know, pretty much every country in the world. How about on Sri Lanka? What's been the impact of that there? Yeah. No, it certainly has had an impact, but keep in mind that we were already in trouble before the war in Ukraine started, but it certainly it is exacerbated. Uh, f first, of course, of course, uh, world uh, oil prices have shot up, um, as and food prices as well, uh, because Ukraine uh, and it was a major exporter of wheat, uh, but also tourism, because uh, it turns out that uh, Russia and Ukraine, Russians and Ukrainians were uh, two of the top five sources of tourists in Sri Lanka. Uh, and those have gone to zero now. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, it's had a it's had a profound effect, but the effect is to exacerbate what was already a very poor situation. Right. All right. You just alluded to the fact that negotiations with the International Monetary Fund have been taking place. What's what's transpired from those talks? Well, uh, two things. Uh, one is that the the we're working with the monetary fund. Uh, to develop a program of fiscal adjustment, essentially reversing some of these policies that got, got us into trouble in the first place. So uh, uh, they're, they're approaching it by trying to raise taxes, which were lowered back in 2019, uh, by cutting some of the subsidies, such as the fuel subsidies and the electricity subsidies, uh, and uh, also raising interest rates because Sri Lanka was trying to maintain low interest rates throughout this period, the last two years. And that led to very high inflation uh, and, and also threatened uh, the, the currency. That, and that's one reason why the currency was so overvalued. So they, the new governor, as who was appointed just a few weeks ago, has raised interest rates by about seven percentage points uh, and also uh, made the exchange rate more flexible. So now the exchange rate has depreciated. It was at it was fixed at 203 rupees to the dollar, and now it's over 300, 350 rupees to the dollar. Hmm. Now, uh, let me just ask you about the neighborhood that Sri Lanka finds itself in. You, uh, I mean, Sri Lanka has two massive neighbors to the north, right? China and India. Are are either of those countries in a position to be helpful? Oh yes, no. They've they've both been uh, helpful in the past and uh, continue to do so. Uh, in particular, India has already come to Sri Lanka's assistance because one of the one of the difficulties is when you embark on a debt restructuring, then it's very difficult during that period of debt restructuring to borrow new money, um, and so India has come in with uh, a bridge. Uh, some bridge financing of various types in order to buy fuel and food and medicines. Um, and I think there's some discussions going on with China as well and possibly with Japan uh, along these lines. So the neighbors are uh, actually coming, coming uh, are being helpful. Understood. Uh, political stability often follows these kinds of meltdowns. And I wonder how much difficulty that adds to the mix as Sri Lanka tries to negotiate with its creditors and the IMF? 
You mean political instability? Instability, also. forgive me, forgive me, <laughs> yes, okay. yes. Just, just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Indeed. Two uh, little letters yeah. make a big difference on, on that <laughs> sentence, don't they? Yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, they, I get asked this question a lot because the, the question that there is uh, some instability in the country, certainly there's this large protest movement going on uh, around the country uh, against the, the, the current government. Uh, the, you know, in terms of the discussions with the IMF, they're really around the policies, the policies and, and, and regulatory changes that the country needs to make in order to bring the fiscal deficit under control. And the IMF really doesn't mind as long as those policies have been implemented, uh, they, they can have a, a very weak government in power or a very strong government in power and they would still be willing to sign the agreement, and they have in the past. Um, and even if the government were to change, I think by and large, whatever is the new government uh, would adopt the same program. Uh, and in fact, I might add that uh, back in January, February, when, when we were trying to push the government to undertake a debt restructuring and uh, approach the IMF, we had some discussions with the members of the opposition parties in uh, parliament, uh, the leaders of the opposition parties, in fact. And they signed a, a, a declaration endorsing the idea of debt restructuring and approaching the IMF. So if there is a change of government and one of these leaders of opposition uh, is the new leader, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they were willing to endorse this program because they already have, in principle, uh, endorsed it. Are you giving odds on whether the current government can survive all of this? I, that's that's very difficult. I'm I'm an economist. I don't predict, <laughs> <laughs> and we economists have trouble predicting the economy. I certainly have no idea what to predict what political outcomes. Uh, yeah, no one doesn't know. But certainly there's there's there are calls for the president's resignation. Sure. Now, uh, in your judgment, what are the ongoing concrete steps that need to be taken in order to get this country back on a firmer fiscal framework? I think they're, they're mainly two things. One is this fiscal adjustment program I described earlier, increasing taxes, lowering subsidies, restructuring some of the state-owned enterprises. So Sri Lankan, for instance, Sri Lankan Airlines, which is an airline, uh, loses about 0.8% of GDP every year. Uh, that's about two thirds of what the country spends on health. Uh, so this is a huge loss uh, to the country. So they need to be restructured. Uh, and the other important thing is that these, these adjustments like tax increases and uh, uh, subsidy cuts, while they mainly affect the rich, do have an impact on the poor. I mean, when, oil, when fuel prices go up, that, hurt, that hurts the poor as well. So the, the, these have to be accompanied by some kind of cash transfer, some way of compensating the poor so they're cushioned from these price increases. And, and that's an integral part of the, of the program. So that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, Sri Lanka needs to renegotiate the debt uh, hmm. that, that, uh, so that the amount they actually have to pay back is something they can pay back. It's what we call a sustainable debt, uh, rather than the current situation, which cannot be paid. Mm. Uh, sadly, I'm down to my last 20 seconds here, but I do want to ask you, you know, the world is obsessed right now with the war in Ukraine and with COVID-19, and I wonder whether that has been problematic for Sri Lanka in terms of getting the attention of enough of the world that might have been able to be more helpful under different circumstances. Um, well, we, we would always appreciate more attention uh, and uh, more support. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, some of that has to do with uh, uh, the, the war in Ukraine and uh, the, the overall global uh, situation. But on the other hand, I'm, I've been impressed by the, the willingness of a large number of players, uh, including the international financial institutions and the, and the national institutions, to uh, recognize the problem that Sri Lanka is in and, and come in uh, with help. Uh, I, I should just add that my, my former colleagues at the World Bank have actually mobilized about $600 million of a, a social protection emergency program that could be delivered over the next few weeks 
uh, that's targeted again at the poor, at uh, people, at school feeding programs for poor children, and uh, for people suffering from kidney diseases and other things in, uh, in, in hospitals. Shanta Devarajan, Georgetown University, thanks for spending so much time with us on TVO tonight. We're grateful. Okay, thanks for having me.